All right. Hi, everyone. Um, so good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Uh, five questions with Michael Posner, hosted by the NYU Alumni Association. Um, so my name is Robert Coventry, and I'm a junior over at the College of Arts and Science. And um, on behalf of the NYU Alumni Association um, and the Student Alumni Council, I just want to thank you for joining us for this very special uh, program. Um, so just a quick note. Um, before we begin today's session, um, please know that all of us at NYU hope you and your family are safe and well in these unprecedented times. Um, we know it's difficult for everyone. Um, in this time of uncertainty, we are so thankful, so very thankful you have chosen to spend some of your time with us to continue learning, um, even virtually, from the collective knowledge of our NYU uh, community. Um, and another note, uh, this session um, as you just heard the notice, is being recorded. Um, so all attendees are muted, uh, but we invite you to type any questions into the Q&A box. Uh, don't worry, uh, we'll save some time at the end for a few Q&A uh, questions for the professor. And um, today's session, it's really an incredible session, um, features Professor Michael Posner, uh, the Jerome Kohlberg Professor of Ethics and Finance at NYU's uh, Stern School of Business. Uh, he is the director of the Center of Business Human Rights at the school, the first ever human rights center at a business school. Fantastic. Uh, so Professor Posner, um, thank you for joining us. Um, we know that you're probably busy in these unprecedented times, but um, I'll begin with our first question um, for the short session we have today. Um, so and this is about uh, developing countries and their labor practices. So um, while there have been transformations in the labor practices of developing countries, um, as we all know, there have been significant missteps. So in a New York Times article last month, you were quoted saying that the Bangladesh Accord on Fire and Building Safety and the Alliance for Bangladesh Worker Safety, quote, made unprecedented improvements to factory safety, but that the question now is how to sustain this progress as leadership shifts to local hands. Definitely true. Um, so a recent report in Bangladesh, uh, quoted in the same New York Times article, stated that the rate of improvement in factory conditions has halted and that a recent factory visit reported, quote, filthy passageways loaded with rubbish and children as young as nine working in garment factories. So what can local governments in Bangladesh and manufacturers learn from the mistakes of the past. So in other words, what can we do to make local manufacturing work? Well, first of all, thank you, Robert, for uh, hosting this. And I wanna thank NYU and the Alumni Association as well. These are, I think, very challenging times for all of us. And um, I feel really proud to be at NYU, part of a university that's uh, really contributing to the community and bringing alumni together. So it's my, I'm really delighted to be on this call. Um, we, we are, because we are in such extraordinary times, a lot of uh, our economic uh, structures are being challenged, including the global supply chain for manufacturing. And the question you ask um, has to be predicated, the answer has to be predicated with uh, an acknowledgement that on all sides, this is a moment for buyers, suppliers, governments, everybody's being challenged in a way that's really unprecedented. Um, Bangladesh, we've done work on Bangladesh for the last seven years since our center was created. And we came to NYU just five weeks before the factory collapsed at Rana Plaza, killing 1,100, mostly young women. And so we've seen a kind of evolution of discussion about the relation between the Bangladesh government, Western global brands, local manufacturers in that time. And as I said in that piece uh, a, a while ago, um, there has been some progress. The brands have come together in a way that's unprecedented to inspect factories and to find a way to improve factory safety, which is a key issue. Um, we're now in a place where I think realistically, um, brands themselves are fighting for their own economic survival, but it also um, means that the, their business partners, the local manufacturers and the workers in those factories 
are in the most precarious place they've been in a long time. So my Absolutely. sense is when we, as we come out of this, and I think we will, it's gonna take a while, but one of the lessons that I draw from where we are today is that there needs to be greater cooperation between businesses, both the global brands and retailers, their local business partners, the factory owners, but also governments, not just the government of Bangladesh or relatively poor governments, but also Western governments that are in a position to be helpful. It's a model we've called shared responsibility. And I think the need for that is more obvious now than it even was a few months ago. Absolutely. And um, we all know that these are incredibly difficult times, but um, the online media has taken a new response to this. So um, as we all know, there's been a lot of uh, misinformation, disinformation regarding um, the coronavirus pandemic, um, which is global now. So how have uh, the major social media companies responded to this threat? Well, I think they've responded um, uh, well, and in fact, in a much more um, ambitious and aggressive way <clears throat> to taking down, both to taking down disinformation, you know, uh, bogus cures or uh, posts online that suggest the, you know, various uh, facts about the coronavirus that are simply not true. They've also promoted real information, important information from the Center for Disease Control and others. So I give them credit for stepping up in a way that frankly we've been critical of Facebook and Google and Twitter in the past for not being vigilant enough in uh, taking down disinformation. What they've shown in the last several months is that they have the capacity when they are motivated and put the resources in to do a much better job. Um, the, we, we've been working on these issues again for five, four or five years, uh, looking at Russian disinformation, political disinformation online. We've done a series of reports on that subject. What's clear is that the claim by the platforms, Google, Facebook, Twitter, that they're not arbiters of the truth is being um, challenged by their own conduct here. They are in fact mm. acting as arbiters of the truth in a way that they should. And I think the lesson for us is this is a good model of how the companies can take greater ownership in moderating content on their platforms, not to take down everything, but things that are provably false and affect mm. political discourse. Those are things that shouldn't be on, on their sites as the pandemic uh, has shown they're able to do that and they're, they deserve credit for what they're doing. That's, that's some good news in these troubling times. So um, that's fantastic to hear. And um, now I'd like to talk about um, one of the major players on the world stage, uh, especially as it comes to this virus, China. So in an article by the South China Morning Post, the SCMP, uh, by Owen Churchill, you stated that the administration needs to, quote, name names, and take a more active role in speaking out against the use of forced la labor in uh, Xinjiang province's re-education camps. Um, we've all heard of that. So earlier this year, US lawmakers recommended sanctions on companies operating in Xinjiang so that disincentivized foreign investment. Um, as of late, the Wall Street Journal has also predicted that foreign investors also plan to leave China due to the impact of the coronavirus pandemic. So, with all those factors, um, do you expect manufacturers to return to North America, um, Japan, Korea, or even Europe, where there are, as an additional benefit, more established uh, labor and safety practices? You know, I think realistically, <clears throat> China has become such a powerful engine of commerce. We're not going to see people abandoning China, and nor should they, frankly. Uh, China is... Uh, now the largest manufacturing base in the world, and they're able to produce high volume things in a reliable way. Um, it doesn't mean that people ought not to be looking for alternatives for a variety of reasons, and I think they will be, but I think we also have to recognize that China is a huge economic player, both on the manufacturing mm -hmm. side, 
but also as a consumer market. Um, Absolutely. That being said, um, I don't think we should give China a, uh, a pass on their internal conduct and the situation you mentioned in particular with the, the Uyghur uh, ethnic minority in Xinjiang province. Uh, more than a million Uyghurs are now being detained in one form or another of uh, political detention, really, by the government. That's unconscionable. And I think we need, the United States government needs to, we as consumers need to, the world community needs to be continuing to put pressure on increasing the pressure on the Chinese government. It is the largest detention of any people anywhere in the world, and it really needs to be challenged at every level. Absolutely. Um, I think we can all agree. Um, and I want to talk further about uh, manufacturing especially as it impacts low wage workers. Um, and that's a good transition because China manufacturing hub. Um, so in an op-ed in Quartz titled, quote, how coronavirus is affecting low wage workers uh, by Natasha Sheriff and Zara Khan, uh, who were also uh, members of NYU Stern Center for Business and Human Rights. Um, there was the broad sentiment, um, more open sentiment that developing countries, and these include Qatar, Bangladesh, Cambodia, Myanmar, they're being negatively affected uh, by the virus doubly so. So through their relative lack of trading leverage and their poor health infrastructure. So in its conclusion, uh, the authors state that, quote, governments and Western companies need to, quote, support manufacturers now in their time of need. Um, so is it truly possible uh, for these developing nations, especially in the midst of a pandemic, uh, to develop manufacturing infrastructure and comprehensive safety measures uh, with limited support uh, from Western <coughs> manufacturers? So I think if the question is, uh, can you expect the government of Bangladesh or Myanmar to be um, uh, stepping up their safety measures now, the answer is it's not going to happen. We are now in, a, again, a financial and economic crisis and a health crisis that is stretching everyone to the limit. I think that the real challenge is uh, right now making sure that as American and European companies are engaged in that global supply chain, that they both make sure that they're going to be able to come out of the crisis in one piece. Lots of companies are really on the brink. Revenues are down. We mm -hmm. see that even some statistics this morning that revenues have gone, have plummeted uh, in the United States retail sales. But we, we need to also be mindful of the people halfway around the world that are producing these products or have produced these products. And I think in every industry, one of the things we're looking at quite closely is whether or not uh, the big global brands are honoring their uh, commercial commitments, their contracts. And we've seen some companies have stepped up. H&M is one, a fast fashion company. They're making sure that they're paying for the work that's been done. They're paying their business partners, the manufacturers. But some other companies have basically said, you know, we're in a crisis, even if you've already produced the material, in a few cases, companies have said, even if we've already received the material, we're mm -hmm. simply not gonna pay you for it. That to me is unconscionable. And it says that we need, we collectively need as a society, as a global society, to make sure that we're uh, being responsible in the way we operate. Absolutely. Maybe that you have to renegotiate some aspect of the terms. New orders need to stop. There are a range of practical things that can be done. But for a global company that has, you know, massive structure to be telling a local business partner, we're not going to pay that which you've already given to us, doesn't make sense. Now, I think if we take a longer view, again, we have to use this moment to learn some lessons and I think one of the lessons that's been obvious for a long time, now painfully obvious, is that people working in very poor countries, the Bangladeshes of the world or, or Cambodia or Myanmar, 
um, governments there are, don't have the capacity, don't have the financial capacity, the structure, mm -hmm. the expertise to do the kinds of things that we would expect done and that are done in this country. There is no equivalent of OSHA in a lot of these countries. Occupational safety and health is kind of left to each uh, industry or each individual factory to figure out. So I think there's room now for uh, some thinking. We had to use this time to think about what's the post-pandemic world look like? And again, what's the right balance of resources so that poor governments are involved centrally, but that they get the support they need both from the private sector, but also from Western governments, from the World Bank, from philanthropy, Again, we've got to have this sort of notion that I referred to earlier as shared responsibility. It's not, if we sort of leave it to just the market to do its thing, we're going to wind up seeing a continuation of some of the extreme uh, uh, lack of safety and poor conditions that you mentioned. Yeah, um, so it seems like the invisible hand um, isn't enough um, as of now, but I'd like to speak about, um, as you mentioned, a massive company. Uh, that's recently been in the news, um, Amazon. So in your recent Forbes article, Amazon's responsibility for workers facing COVID-19, uh, you recommended that consumers and investors, quote, challenge mega corporations in their policies regarding hazard pay and um, financially supporting overseas workers. So more broadly, uh, consumers and investors, you say, need to challenge Amazon to outsource manufacturing more, responsibil more responsibly, uh, that's a shared responsibility, and to meaningfully address the risks to those doing this labor for Amazon goods. Um, so while consumers broadly disagree uh, with Amazon's policies, including as Time stated in 2019, their quote, treatment of workers like robots, uh, their competitive nature, low prices, and outright e-commerce <coughs> dominance um, incentivize consumers to shop. So the recent lockdowns in addition have only exaggerated demand um, with Amazon even hiring 100,000 new workers for pandemic sales. Uh, so long story short, uh, do you believe that the domestic market uh, will challenge Amazon even in consideration of their widespread and current success? And what advice do you have for Amazon and other similarly massive companies during this crisis? Let me say a couple of things about that. One is, um, I wrote that piece probably, uh, I don't know, four or five weeks ago. And uh, people from Amazon actually reached out to me and we did have a quite good conversation last week. I'm not gonna go into the details of that. But one of the things that's clear to me is, as again, we see the shifts in the economy um, online shopping, online commerce is now on the ascendancy. Amazon is at the front of the pack. We can see that a lot of retailers, big retailers are now suffering and some of them are gonna struggle to come back if they do at all. Mm -hmm. So I think as we're looking at the economy of the United States or the global economy going forward, the Amazon model is gonna be one that we need to pay much greater attention to. And my point in the piece, and what I will say and, and did say to Amazon when we spoke, is that they have an obligation in my judgment to look beyond simply their domestic workforce, although there are a range of issues with their, the people in the fulfillment centers and the drivers, et cetera. But they are, as you say, putting stuff online uh, from a wide range of companies. Some of it may be produced responsibly, some not. And I think as we look to the future of, of online shopping, it becomes ever more important that the, uh, the intermediaries, the Amazons of the world that are uh, helping to facilitate that, do it in a way that pays much greater attention. Uh, I'm gonna keep pushing them. We had a good conversation, I'm not gonna stop. But I do think Amazon has tremendous leverage and I at least want to encourage them and I will continue to encourage them to use that leverage and to be more attentive to their, their business partners, the companies that are promoting their materials on their site 
and making sure that there's more of a an attention to basic you know decency and dignity mm -hmm. and work um, throughout that global supply chain it is a daunting task and i would acknowledge that because there is so much being sold over that website and it's growing all the time even more so today they're probably doing better today than they've ever done because we're all stuck at home and we sit on our computers and order things um, but I, I think this is a moment where amazon can really step up and uh, turn over a new leaf and really begin to look at um, its relationship with the, the people the companies that are producing things that they that they sell definitely um it's a fantastic response, um, and it's so important, um, especially for the future of e-commerce. So um, that is our fifth question. Uh, so thank you, Professor, for your time. Um, but before you go, um, just some quick Q&A questions um, from the audience, uh, the student audience that have typed. So, well, the student and faculty. Um, so one that I think that could be clarified further is how can we as consumers um, put pressure on China for their mistreatment of the Uyghur population? Well, I think there are a couple of things to say to that. One is um, I think that these are issues that involve uh, government to government uh, diplomacy. Um, there are people and it's a bipartisan group in the Congress that are attentive to these issues. Senator, Ru everybody from Senator Rubio, a conservative Republican on the right, to Jim McGovern, who's a liberal Massachusetts congressman, uh, leads something called the Congressional Executive Commission on China. They've been very, very active, and they're trying to push, as I'm trying to push, um, the uh, current administration, the Trump administration, to have a a much more consistent view with respect to this. And I think Secretary Pompeo and others have said things about the Uyghurs and about our concerns about human rights. But this is a moment for a bipartisan political response to the Chinese government coming from our government. I think we as consumers also have to be attentive to the uh, relationship some of our companies have to make sure mm -hmm. that we're paying attention, that we're registering our concern, both in our role as consumers, but also as investors. And one of the things that I've pushed on pretty hard is a number of big Western investment firms are supporting, for example, Chinese technology firms that are providing to the Chinese government surveillance technology that's being used in Sinjin. Um, so I think we have a role both as consumers, as citizens to our members of Congress, but also as investors to be mindful of what's going on. Absolutely. So um, to continue with that shared social responsibility, um, do you feel that companies should adopt uh, such a protocol when it comes to uh, stakeholders or in investors in terms of their involvement with workers? And if so, uh, which companies get this get this protocol right? Well, I would say you know we're we're working. Our uh, center the motto is that we're pro company. We want high standards, and we are in every, We're working in a range of industries: manufacturing. We're working with the construction industry in the uh, Arabian Gulf in terms of migrant workers. There are ten million migrant workers doing construction, mostly from South Asia. We're working with the investment sector. We're working with technology. I think in every sector, there are leaders. But our theory is, and it's, uh, we, we feel it quite strongly, industry competitors need to put their competitive juices aside and come together around human rights standards and metrics, ways of measuring progress, and develop forms of accountability and assessment. And, in, and I chair something called the Fair Labor Association, which is 60 apparel manufacturing companies and then some agricultural companies, Nike, Adidas, Patagonia, mm -hmm. Nestle on the eggs, agriculture side. 
those are industry leaders that have come, stepped up to the plate and said, we're willing to be judged by a set of industry standards. I think that's mm -hmm. the way to go here, at least in the interim, until we have 193 governments that are protecting their own people. We've got to be creative and look for ways to do this uh, using industry, but industry, civil society, um, mm. government, uh, universities, we need to come together in a way that we're working together and challenging each other. Absolutely. Um, I think our audience can completely agree on that aspect of shared responsibility. And um, for our last question here, um, this is a relative softball. Uh, so how should companies and governments protect those who deliver their goods in an online shopping world? Well, I think uh, one thing I would like to see our government doing and other governments doing is uh, perform uh, more um, responsibly in terms of its own purchasing practices. The government, our government is the largest uh, uh, customer for almost everything. Uh, mm -hmm. food and clothing and computers and the like. Um, I think in its own purchasing practices, um, we need to be trying to push our government to say, if you want to do business with Uncle Sam, this is what we expect. And one of my colleagues, uh, is uh, Isabel Glemsher, is working now to try to come up with some standards for that. I mm -hmm. think as consumers, um, we ought to be demanding that the companies that are producing, that are online or, or in stores, are paying attention to these things. The more com companies in the apparel industry or in the food industry um, or in a whole range of consumer-facing industries pay a lot of attention to what their consumers say. And we're not, I think, as organized as we ought to be as consumers, the more you ask, the more you push, the more you say, this matters. We're beginning to see in the investment space, millennials and women in particular are twice as likely to be concerned about the environment or human rights as old white guys like me. And so I think there's a real value when you start to see consumer pressure also generated through the investment space companies really will pay attention to that. So we all have a role to play. And I think it's just imper imperative that we use this moment uh, of crisis to think about the world we want to live in post-coronavirus. Absolutely. Uh, Post-corona uh, will be a new term, I assume, in the coming uh, months or even years. Um, so I just wanted to thank you again, uh, Professor Posner, NYU Stern. Um, who is the Jerome Kohlberg Professor of Ethics and Finance, um, also the director of the Center for Business and Human Rights at the school, first ever Human Rights Center at a business school. So um, from everyone here at NYU, um, I just want to thank you for your time. Uh, we hope that you're doing well. Um, you know, uh, thank you again, Professor, for your insight. And I just wanted to thank everyone for attending as well. Uh, some excellent questions in the Q&A box. So thank you, everyone. Uh, please have a safe and uh, happy rest of your week. Thank you again, Professor. Sure. Thank you, Robert. I enjoyed talking to you. Thank you.